Good evening. It's uh, our pleasure to have uh, twice in one week a distinct speaker about who all of us here. Stanislav is not only a speaker, as you all know, he's a very good scientist. We love to read his books, we love to read his papers, and we love to host you here. Thank you very much for the beautiful talk of Tuesday, and today we will have a seminar. Stanislav comes from College de France, but his real place of work is near Paris, Chicalet. Sackley. Sackley. <laughs> it's the Austin Center where they do a lot of imaging and have many plans for new buildings. And I think we are kind of in a competition which building will be finished first. This one here or the one in Sackley. <laughs> and uh, we thank you very much. And today, uh, Today, uh, it's time for us to tell us more about advances in understanding the brain mechanisms of consciousness. After Tuesday, when we had high enough problems with language, let's see what we can <laughs> understand about consciousness. Even thank worse. you very much for being here. Well, thank you for your hospitality. It is, it's really great to be here. and Thank you for showing up in such large numbers. I, uh, oh, can you hear? Maybe if I bring it closer, is that better? Okay. Maybe like this. How is that? Is that good enough? Okay. Even louder? Okay. Even higher. Higher, louder. Uh, I think it's, it's right now. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, in the talk today, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the work we've done in the lab uh, in, as part of a project funded by the ERC. Uh, the European Research Council to search for signatures of conscious processing. And I have to say, uh, it's great to give such a talk. I, for a long time, I thought there's not much that we could say about consciousness. But I think now uh, there is a lot of progress that's been made. And in fact, it was not so hard because we have protocols that are appropriate to study this field. Uh, we don't think about it too much, but in fact, very simple protocols such as masking or the attentional blink allow you to manipulate the consciousness of subjects at will. And we are talking here about the particular meaning, of course, of the word consciousness, which is very now. Um, we'll try to broaden it at the end of this talk. Uh, this is the concept of conscious access. Sometimes there is information on your retina, but you don't access it and you don't become conscious of it. And sometimes there is information on your retina and you become conscious of it. So um, the work that I've been trying to do is uh, try to understand what are the limits of what you can do non-consciously and what happens when information becomes conscious. It's all a bit abstract, uh, but uh, to make it concrete, I would like to immediately show you an example of what we do. Uh, it's a demonstration. It's the actual software that we've been using in the lab. Uh, it's an old version. And... Um, I hope it will work with this projector. It may be a little bit off, but uh, we'll see. Um, so this is a, a case of masking. We are, uh, of course, in my lab, always using digits and words. So this is a case with digits. We flash you a digit for one frame of the projector, 16 milliseconds. Then it goes away, and there is a blank. And the, we will vary the duration of the blank, OK, how long it is. Then there will be a mask. And you see that the mask surrounds the location where the digit appears. And um, what I ask you simply is to uh, see if you can name the digit, OK? And if you see it. So we start with a long duration, and I hope you see it. Nine, OK? And then we make it slightly shorter. And when it's 100 milliseconds, you can still see it. Right. I hope you see it. Maybe some of you won't sometimes. There is variability. 66 tend to be close to threshold, but you should still be able to see it. And then 33, can you see it? OK. Can you run it again? It's still running. I mean, believe it or not, the digit is still there. It's the same exact digit. Same exact digit. No, I can't, of course. <laughs> but that's the point. <laughs> so, OK, so think about it. So the digit is still there. 
uh, I'm glad it works. <laughs> it works all the time. So people vary in their threshold, but they have the phenomenon all the time. So um, what you've seen here is a situation where we can uh, essentially ask two questions. The first question we can ask is, what happened to this digit? It was there on, a, on your retina all the time, okay? Uh, so uh, it was probably there in your visual cortex. How far can it go uh, before it gets uh, conscious? How deep can be the processing of subliminal stimuli? And then the question, of course, is what is unique to conscious stimuli? What happens when you can name it? Is there something additional in the brain? And, th and this is essentially the search for what I call signatures of consciousness, something that would be quite unique to conscious perception. We've been playing this game with a variety of methods, behavioral methods, uh, of course, uh, fMRI, but the most interesting has been to try to pursue the time course of processing of such stimuli. And today I'll be sp speaking about EG, MEG, and we did also some work with intracranial recordings. And in the end of my talk, I'll uh, try to uh, explore some of the consequences of being able to speak about signatures of, con of consciousness. We're very interested also in practical applications in uh, detecting consciousness in uh, organisms that are not able to report whether or not they have consciousness. So, uh, of course, infants are interesting, but especially also patients that are in vegetative state or coma. Uh, we may have suspicions that there may still be residual consciousness, although they look like they are vegetative. <coughs> so how can we tell? So, um, so this is the very paradigm that you were submitted to, the digit followed by the mask. And in the first experiment, uh, already a while ago with Antoine Delcu, we uh, gathered some basic EG data using these 256 channel nets in a very simple situation. We wanted to have both objective and subjective judgment. So the objective judgment was um, please decide whether the number you saw was larger or smaller than five. You can do so in a forced choice situation even when you uh, think you have not seen the stimulus. Then the second thing was, have you seen it or not? Tell us by using a cursor. Uh, the cursor has this interesting property that it can be continuous and uh, you can really use all of the gradations from fully not seen, there was nothing at all, to uh, maximal visibility. And so this gave us very basic data. I'm not going to go too slow on this published work, but um, the first basic data is this existence of a sort of threshold. Uh, you see that this both subjective visibility, percentage of seen trials, as well as objective performance, climb in a sort of sudden manner around 50 milliseconds, 40, 50 milliseconds. And different people vary in their thresholds but the non-linearity exists in everybody. It's just the exact location that varies. And so this, each point here is a different subject. And you can see that both the objective and the subjective thresholds are highly correlated. So there is something dramatically changing when you cross the threshold of consciousness. In fact, I am sure you felt it. You have the impression you have zero information. It's not quite true. You have a little bit of information. But when you cross the threshold, suddenly it becomes massively more available. And there's also something interesting in this paradigm. It's not true of all paradigms, perhaps, but in this one, you tend to have an all or none pattern of responding. I think you felt that. Suddenly, the digit went away. There was a feeling that there was nothing at all on screen. So subjects use um, the uh, cursor here, but they tend to use only the lowest category or only the highest category. Very little responding in between. Um, and it looks like a bistable phenomenon. So what we did was we did EEG recordings of this paradigm, and we try to track each of the individual uh, EG peaks, like the P1A, P1B, N1, and N2, and different latencies, P3, and uh, for left targets and right targets, so there is a certain amount of retinotopy to these components, like the N1, for instance. And for each of them, we were asking, is the amplitude uh, a good predictor of what the subject is going to report? So you see the different durations here, and you can immediately see that the P1A, for instance, or the P1B, or the N1 are not very good correlates of the visibility curves of the subjects because they basically they are too high activations for the very short durations. There might be a little bit of a curve here, but it's not like the reports of the subjects. And for instance, it's very clear that you can have a very strong N1 without any form of consciousness. Now, in this experiment, we found that the correct non-linearity appeared at the level of the P3 quite late in the epoch. Uh, it takes about 300 milliseconds before you find brain events that begin to radically distinguish between seen and unseen trials. And this is something we've seen in several experiments. It, we can try to reconstruct the sources of this activity. This is a coarse 
uh, model, of course, because you know the problems of localizing sources from EEG, so you have to take it with a grain of salt. But at the peak of this P3 effect, we are seeing bilateral activity. Interesting that it's bilateral, even though the stimulus is unilateral. And uh, it tends to activate the ventral stream, of course, especially on the left side, as well as bilateral frontal activations and parietal activations. And in these areas, we see some interesting dynamics. Um, we can distinguish two phases. You see that if we uh, make a sort of virtual source in the occipital temporal cortex here, what we see first is a sort of linear stage where the activation is just linearly related to the duration uh, of the delay between the stimulus and the mask. And in particular, if you focus on the green curve, for instance, there is already quite strong activation just as where it should be on this linear uh, uh, amount of activation here for the 33 millisecond condition. Now, that was the one that you judge almost completely invisible. Creates a strong visual activation first, but then during the second phase, drops to zero. And you can see this second phase is much more uh, bimodal. It has essentially the right characteristic of this nonlinear responding of visibility by the subjects. And at this phase, you see not only activation in the visual cortex, but also a lot of activation in the prefrontal cortex, which seems to be largely selective for this second phase, right? And same for the uh, parietal cortex, which is not so visible here. So uh, this is something that seems to be common to many experiments. We published a review also of this uh, two years ago. And um, I just want to show you another experiment where we reconstructed the time course of activity. This is in a different paradigm, which I think is perhaps even more diagnostic of these changes from conscious to non-conscious. It's called the attentional blink, the situation where you temporarily distract the subject with another task. And uh, if you do that at the right moment, whatever stimulus appears a little bit after this first distracting stimulus has a high chance of being invisible uh, if it is lightly masked. So we placed ourselves at the threshold. We had words that could be half of the time seen, half of the time not seen. It's a great paradigm because it's the same exact stimulus. It's the same exact word on the retina, but half of the time is seen, half of the time is not seen by the subject, according to their subjective reports. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, the antivirus wants to contribute to the lecture, but we won't allow that. So um, what you are seeing here is a reconstruction of the brain activity on the left hemisphere, on the right hemisphere. And in the middle, you see the ventral view with the occipital here. And uh, let's look at how it unfolds. And you will see something essentially very similar to the masking paradigm I just show you, except just even crisper in a certain sense. What you see, if I, oh, oh, this is so annoying. Sorry. I don't know if you experience the same thing. There's a new version of Windows, a new version of PowerPoint, and it's even worse than before. <laughs> so now. Can I stop this? No, I can't. That's interesting. OK, I'll stop it here. So I, I, I wanted to show you that the visual activity is essentially the same for seen and not seen trials. I stopped it a little bit later. This is the N170 here. You see that the activation started in the occipital pole and then expanded into the temporal cortex. Again, it's not very precise. I think it's up to several centimeters here. But you can see something very clear. Activations become left lateralized for this symbolic stimulus. But uh, it's a word here. But you see that there is essentially no distinguishable activity between the seen and the not seen child. There may be little, little bit here. Um, and it's only a bit later on that you're going to see this massive divergence within the trial. So now we continue the movie. And um, essentially, now you see the activations become hugely amplified for the seen trials. Uh, this is something that uh, we've called ignition with Jean-Pierre Changeux and with Lionel Nakache. This idea that you cross a threshold and suddenly the, the activation becomes self-amplifying. It, it begins to uh, reverberate through the system. It activates the inferior prefrontal regions here. Um, it's not that the activation stops during the unconscious processing. You can still see it going on. But it seems to be much more encapsulated in the temporal lobe here whereas here it has really expanded into many other areas. So I'll just say a word about the uh, theory that is guiding us for these experiments and that may account for what you have just seen. It seems that we can have a lot of initial processing along chains that start in the periphery but may, may go quite deep into uh, the higher levels of processing in a non-conscious situation. So we have many specialized systems that can process information non-consciously. 
because they are specialized for processing this information. But the proposal here is that at a certain level, there is a system of processors that uh, have a special connectivity that allows them to exchange information. And the claim is that what we are seeing uh, and what we are reporting as being conscious of a stimulus is simply the fact that information has achieved this level of representation where it begins to be shared across the brain. And uh, maybe it's as simple as that. What we call being conscious of a piece of information is that we have this information in the system that allows it to be held online. This is very similar to working memory, of course. It can be very brief, but during this moment, it's held online and it's shareable, so you can flexibly use it. And in particular, this is why you can report it, because you can transmit the information to verbal processes that will report on information. But it's not just about the report. Even if you don't report, you may hold it in working memory. You may uh, store it in long-term memory. You may evaluate it. You may route it to your motor system, and so on and so forth. So it's a routing system, system for holding the information and routing it. That's the idea. And I think it may account for what we are seeing, very late divergence, sort of all or none. So you may have a stimulus which is supra-threshold, what we call pre-conscious, could be conscious, but it's blocked because your attention is oriented elsewhere and your workspace system is already occupied by uh, another piece of information. So what I want to show you today is recent experiments where we've tried to test this idea in various ways, and in particular using decoding, and then moving on to the patients. Um, but um, there is one idea here, which is that uh, consciousness is not a magical property. It's a property of the function of the system. There should be some operations that are simply not feasible non-consciously. A lot of things can be started not consciously, but according to this idea, it should not be possible to uh, use information flexibly, um, and therefore we should really see some sort of all or none differences between uh, operations that are and are not feasible without consciousness. So uh, we, uh, we are asking here a very simple question. Um, does metacognition, and in particular error detection, occur without uh, consciousness, or does it require conscious access? So um, I think you know what is metacognition, is the ability to entertain thoughts about your own mental processes. And um, it's been suggested that almost by definition, uh, this requires consciousness. According to Rosenthal, for instance, um, it is only when you can have a second order thought that you know that you know, you know that you see, that you can claim to be conscious. This is almost a definition of consciousness. So according to this view, metacognition should uh, require consciousness. But uh, if you think of it in more plain terms, maybe in Bayesian terms, signal detection theory, um, anytime we have evidence about a stimulus, we may have evidence about a higher level, uh, whether we are making an error or not. We can have a confidence signal. Um, so maybe confidence can be computed non-consciously. And um, so we'll try to resolve this debate here. And I'll tell you there's a little bit of grain of truth in both. But what we are looking at here is something that I think many of you are familiar with, which is called the error related negativity. Um, it's a remarkable phenomenon at the brain level that when you click in one of these reaction time tasks, like deciding whether a number is larger or smaller than five, you click a button, and when you make an error, uh, you immediately notice it. Uh, you click the button, and in fact, you maybe you try to stop from clicking, and you get this enormous response over the midline of the uh, frontal electrodes. It's called the error-related negativity because it's very negative, and it starts almost com contemporaneous with the click, so zero is the click here, develops into a massive negativity before you've had any sensory feedback, and essentially before you've had any reward as well. So it's a sort of internal computation. Now, I always thought this is a very interesting thing because if you think about it, it's the very same brain which is doing the clicking in the first place and then which is detecting that it's making an error, right? So it's a bit strange. The clicking in the first place is not random at all. It's very often correct. But when it's not correct, there is another system in the brain that somehow knows better. And, and uh, we'd like to understand how that works. So um, we were wondering whether... Um, the ERN belongs to prefrontal types of operations, uh, executive attention. We know the ERN relates to the cingulate cortex and perhaps the anterior cingulate. Now it's thought that it's much distributed across the cingulate. So maybe it's really some, one of these operations that belong to this inner circle of conscious operations, 
But maybe it's just uh, an automatic response that you find whenever there is a motor conflict, for instance. This has been claimed by Matthew Bodvinik, for instance. So in this case, maybe you would expect to find it even non-consciously. So we uh, try to resolve this question by going uh, this time with EG plus MEG, because in meanwhile we had both an MEG machine, and we flashed a digit, same delay, letters, um, but uh, Lucy Charles now uh, recorded slightly different behavior. The first thing we did was to have the same objective cast, larger or smaller than five, made as fast as possible. The idea was that if we put speed pressure, subjects would make some errors. So in experiment one, the, uh, this was really speedy judgment. In experiment two, we relaxed that, that pressure. Second thing was we recorded our usual subjective visibility rating, just seen or not seen. Okay. And the third thing was we asked whether subjects had metacognitive judgment in the sense of deciding whether they had made an error or not. So they had to decide whether they were right or wrong on the first task, this objective task. Okay. Um, now, they had to do this even when they responded not seen. So this was a little bit funny. They had to force themselves to respond. They might say, I didn't see anything. They still had to say whether their first response was correct or not. So what did we find? The first thing we found about the ERN was very clear. So here what we do is we take the event-related potentials separately for correct trials and for error trials. There were a lot of errors. There was about 20% of errors, even when subjects were reporting seeing the digit. And you have the result here on screen. When we do this subtraction of correct, sorry, error minus correct uh, trials, you see a huge ERN, but only on trials where subjects reported the seeing the digit. Absolutely nothing when they reported not seeing the digit. And it was true even if we sorted the trials as a function of their duration, such that they were, in fact, trials of the same duration in the seen or in the unseen category. This is the 33 millisecond condition that you're familiar with now, the blue. You get this huge ERN in the few trials where subjects have seen the stimulus, but not when they have not seen the stimulus. And likewise, I think, at 50 milliseconds. So clearly, there's this sort of all or none component of activation. Here, the subjects are only able to make this computation of the error-related negativity when they are aware of the digit, even for a fixed stimulus. Um, something is radically changing in their brain, and we could relate that to activation of the anterior and posterior cingulate. Similar sources have been reported in the literature. Um, they couldn't correct when they didn't see. Their brain did not generate the error-related negativity. Okay. Not when it was not seen, exactly. Now, whether they could not correct is another matter, and that's exactly where I'm going now. So this is about the uh, confidence without consciousness. So we can analyze the behavioral data, not just the brain data, the behavioral data. And I think, again, you are familiar, of course, with signal detection theory. It's a way to analyze, compute the D prime for the first order task. Subjects are responding left or right. We know whether the target was smaller than five or larger than five. We can classify the responses as hits or correct rejections, false alarms, misses. We get the D prime. Now, I think you know also that we can do that at the second level. So this time, the subject responded, I think I made an error, or I think I was correct. We know whether it was an error or whether it was correct. So we can do the same sort of computation. It's called second order D prime. In fact, we can compute what is called meta D prime which is a way to put the 2D primes on the same scale. I won't go into that, but it's a nice computation. So we did exactly that, and Lucy Charles did that for a PhD. And um, let me guide you through these results. So what you are seeing here is, as a function of the SOA between the digit and the mask, how did these D primes vary? And we look first at the trials where subjects reported seeing the stimulus. So they are this curve and this curve for the D prime and the meta D prime. And you see it's normal. They were better than chance, much better than chance, both for uh, the first order task and for the metacognitive task. But what's interesting is what happened in the unseen condition. Now, first of all, you can see there's a big jump. So there's much more information when you report seeing than when you report not seeing uh, in both of these curves, right? But second thing is, okay, the first order task is a chance for these three points of duration. But the second order task is not a chance. So this is quite remarkable. So subjects are responding too fast, probably, to have any information about the stimulus. 
But when they are given a little bit more time and they give this metacognitive response, they still think they are responding at chance, but they are not. They are doing better than chance, and it's climbing as a function of the amount of evidence that they had about the stimulus. Right? What's the second uh, response? So the second response is, do you think you've made an error, or do you think you were correct? Right? And that's where they are better than chance. So um, we just think that this one was responded too fast to be correct, and that's why we run the second experiment where there was no speed pressure. Now, in this case, the ERN goes away because there are not enough error trials, but we can look at the behavior, and now the behavior changes, and both curves become aligned. You see, the first order behavior is better than chance, even on the unseen trials, and the second order behavior is aligned with the first order behavior. Okay. So you have evidence about the stimulus, and you also have second order evidence about how well you've been doing, this non-consciously. So we're left with something a bit funny. You know, on the one hand, the ERN is all or none. On the other hand, confidence is not all or none, and it's better than chance uh, on unconscious trials. So what's happening here? Can we explain it? So I want to try to explain it. And first, I want to explain the first part, well, rather the second part, the, the confidence part. So uh, the subliminal data that we are getting is essentially fully compatible with type 2 signal detection theory. When there is evidence for a first task, there is evidence for a second order task. So um, this is how it works. In signal detection theory, you have these typical distributions of uh, the uh, internal activation as a function of when there is a signal and when there is noise. You can make a type 1 judgment by placing a criterion uh, somewhere in the middle. But as soon as you do that, you can also do better than chance in responding for a type 2 judgment by using the position of your sample relative to, uh, I mean, the distance of that sample relative to the initial boundary, okay? So if you think about it, what you can do here is decide that you are confident about your response. It's probably correct when you are far from the boundary. So you would have high confidence here and high confidence here. But if you're too close to the boundary, it's rather likely that you made an error because you are really, you don't have a lot of evidence one way or the other. If you use this strategy, you're going to be better than chance in second order responding and this has nothing to do with consciousness. It's just the availability of some evidence. So we believe that this is what is happening non-consciously, that each brain area is accumulating some evidence about the stimulus. This can be done fully non-consciously, and it's enough to give you first-order responding as well as confidence inside a given brain system. In fact, maybe I'll go fast about it, but we are thinking about ways to extend a little bit the uh, signal detection theory in ways that have... They are not extremely original, but to try to expand it to account for what happens in a multidimensional space here. Because what I think what is not quite nice about signal detection theory is the, the idea of a single axis along which the stimuli are categorized. So, and this is uh, related, I think, to what Haim Sampolinsky and other people are thinking about. The, the idea is that the stimulus, for instance, a digit that you are seeing more or less well, is really translated into a vector in your head a neuronal vector, perhaps, that's building up in strength, but it's also rotating along many dimensions of this huge dimensional space as uh, the signal is, is building up. And we should think of these tasks not as just one category versus the other, but multiple categories. So each task is a multi-class inference on a large internal space. And if we think about it this way, we can go a very long way to our explaining not just forced choice judgment, but even the visibility judgment itself, when you say that you've seen or when you say that you have not seen. Um, it's possible that we should uh, think of conscious perception as a kind of internal inference. But the only difference with this type of inference is that now you have to choose what you've seen, one out of perhaps a million of stimuli that you could have seen, right? And one of them is... I decide that I have seen no digit. So no digit is part of the space of possibilities. <coughs> so for the fourth choice, it's just larger than five, smaller than five. But for uh, visual identification, conscious identification, it's a much larger space, which could explain that it takes more time. And one of the conclusions is possibly that you have not seen anything. So um, these are just a few figures from a paper that we are publishing with Jean-Rémy King, a very bright uh, PhD student. Uh, in, in a special issue of Proceedings of the Royal Society, um, just to give you the flavor of this sort of modeling, I think it will be familiar to those of you who are familiar with signal detection theory. So you have to think, maybe I go back once, you have to think that a stimulus is a vector pointing in a certain direction, another stimulus is another vector, and not seeing 
is another position of these activation vector, maybe closer to the origin here, because essentially you, you are trying uh, to decide there was no stimulus at all, right? So now you're trying to make optimal inferences with just a system. Well, choosing whether it's x or y, whether it's larger than 5 or smaller than 5, is like putting a boundary here. You may do that even if the stimuli are close to this part where you would want to respond that, in fact, there was no stimulus. So this can explain that you respond absent, but if you only have to categorize in this way, you may still do better than chance, right? Um, and confidence judgment is a little bit like this. You're placing boundaries on uh, the distance between the primary boundary that you were using for task one. So this is task one. This is the second order task. You may account for confidence judgments just with this sort of uh, optimal responding. So a completely optimal decision system may generate the data that I've shown you, and uh, it may in particular help to understand why even with a constant stimulus, you get the, the fact that seen stimuli are better discriminated than unseen stimuli. So if you think about it for a second, so uh, if these are your stimuli, X and Y, and they correspond to distributions of activation with a certain uncertainty here, a certain noise, when you focus on the scene trial, you select part of the distribution, which is outside of this region where the subject is responding, there was no stimulus. Okay. So by selecting this, you are enhancing the mean difference between your X and Y stimuli. When you're selecting for the unseen stimuli, you're selecting the other part of the response space, you're selecting for stimuli that were falling in this region, so their discriminability is going to be lower. And again, all of the properties that we are finding in this experiment can be modeled as just some kind of optimal responding. So I think with this sort of model, we can explain uh, the uh, higher than chance confidence judgments that we are finding with non-conscious stimuli. But how can we explain the other part, which is the all or none error-related negativity. It seems that once you've decided that there was a stimulus, so you're not in this region, there are additional operations you can do. And ERN is one of them. You can detect on a single trial your own errors. I'm not sure if this is completely clear what is the difference between these two systems, right? What I've just told you here is a sort of statistical computation. In average, across hundreds of trials, you do better than chance. But on a single trial, you don't know whether you've made an error or not. You click, you're not sure, and you statistically do better than chance. Now, the ERN is very different. The ERN is on a single trial basis. You click, and immediately on this trial, you know you've made an error. You're highly confident that you've made an error. So how do you do this? Not with a statistical mechanism, but I claim with a comparison mechanism. So the idea is very, very simple. It's a dual road model. So I've just told you that you can go from perception to motor action with a non-conscious accumulation of evidence. Uh, you can do better than chance on this route, and you can even have an unconscious hunch of confidence. All of this without consciousness. Now, what I claim is that when you are conscious, you go through a higher route as well. The information goes through a second route with a threshold, and this allows you to develop a conscious intention of what you should be doing. When you are conscious of the stimulus, you know what should be your response, right? Now, most of the time, you would like <coughs> your action to follow your intention. But if you are under speed pressure in particular, very often this route will have responded before this route has concluded. And then you are left with an action that may or may not be right, but may differ from the one that you intended to make, okay? So my claim is that the ERN comes from a comparison of these two systems. You just compare what you are currently doing with what you should have been doing. And you see immediately that according to this model, you cannot get an ERN if you don't know what you should have been doing. So if you don't have a crossing of the threshold for conscious perception, then uh, you are left with a complete inability to know on a single trial basis whether or not you've made an error. And of course, uh, this uh, unconscious trials will allow you to become aware of your own error. So when the digit is seen, there is both an action and an intention, and you can get an ERN. When the digit is not seen, there is an action, but there is no intention, so there is no ERN. Very simple. I could discuss also other paradigms, maybe in the question period, like the new one why is paradigm. So we decided to test this model, and um, this is one idea how to test this, is uh, multivariate decoding. 
I am very excited about this uh, development. Uh, you know that there is a lot of multivariate decoding in fMRI, but we can also do it in MEG. And in MEG, the one thing which is very nice we can do, we can take a slice of time, and in this slice of time, we have a lot of information from all of the sensors of MEG and all of the electrodes of EEG. So we can train a multivariate decoder to try to tell us what was the stimulus or what was the response of the subject, various aspects of what was going on on the trial. And typically, for instance, if we ask about where was the stimulus, was it on the top or on the bottom of the screen, we see the information be at chance, and then suddenly it rises, and then it drops again, right? So we can have an idea of the time course of decoding. But there's much more than that that we can do. We can, tell, we can see whether the decoder is the same at different moments. It may not be the same hyperplane, which is cutting through your data to decode, and we can look for generalization across time. I want to show you that this is a very powerful method. I may not have time to go in some detail, but you get the idea that there is the trading time for your decoder, but there's also the testing time, and you can completely uh, make a full matrix of generalization here, which will tell you, okay, the information was there, but it is still there later in time. It's stable. So you can test for the stability of information. So how should this work in this experiment? Well, if I am right, we can create a decoder for various aspects of information. We should be able to test whether the stimulus was above or below the fixation point, for instance, the perception part. And this we should be able to do whether it's conscious or non-conscious. We should be able to decode the action, left or right, whether it's conscious or non-conscious. But if the model is right, we should be able to decode the intention of the subject only when he reported seeing the stimulus, not when he reported not seeing the stimulus. And we should also be able to decode the error only when he was conscious. Okay. So this is what we were testing with our decoders. So I just give you a little bit of the details of how this was done. So first, we split the data according to visibility. We have seen trials and unseen trials. Then we create four decoders that try to decode from the same data the stimulus position, the actual motor response, the intention, and the accuracy. Now, you may wonder how we do this decoders here, it's relatively simple because we have a lot of errors. So we have the actual response of the subject, left or right, and we call the required, res we call the intended response what was the required response according to instructions, left or right. Because we have many errors, all of these cells are full here, and we can equalize the number of trials in each of them. And um, then once we do that, we really have three orthogonal uh, decoders. One is for the actual response, these categories of trials. Another is for the required response, so these categories of trials. And the fourth a third one is for correct versus error trials. It's orthogonal to the first two, right? Okay. So these are the results. We have the seen trials, we have the unseen trials, and we look as a function of time for decoding of stimulus position. You can see that we get information both about the seen and the unseen stimulus. There's a spike and then it goes away. It's a little bit less accurate for the unseen trials. We also decode the response of the subject. You can see that it rises a little bit later and stays a little bit more sustained, and we, we still have the information for the unseen trials. This is the key test. We're trying to decode the intention of the subject, and we can decode it better than chance for uh, the seen trials, but not at all for the unseen trials. You know, and this is, uh, I would insist, it's a sort of non-trivial thing. The subject is clicking all the time. And at the very same time that he's clicking the wrong button, we are able to make a decoder that uses his brain activity to tell what was the correct response. Now, that's a little bit of a funny thing. Right? So the same brain is clicking. We decode his actual response, but we also decode what he should have been doing. And it's there in his head. Okay. And, of course, what's also there in his head is whether he was correct or not a little bit later. So this is the error versus correct decoding. And again, only feasible when the trial was classified as seen, not when it was unseen. In fact, we can, and Lucy Shaw did this, we can on a single trial basis see that the amount of signal here is a function of a comparison of the size of these two signals. So the larger these two signals, the larger the error-related uh, uh, response here. So uh, there is a sense in which we can validate this notion that it's a comparison of these two signals that give you the third one. All of that, of course, is occurring uh, in the time course of trials for which we can also create a decoder for seen versus unseen, right? So uh, here you can see that the ability to decode seen versus unseen trials starts quite early, uh, but also uh, continues for a long time. 
we believe that the seen versus unseen judgment is hiding a lot of computations that uh, correspond to first an amplification of sensory information and then to uniquely conscious computations, such as the computation of an intention here. Well, this is a lot of information, but uh, in the last 10 minutes, I want to uh, give you a flavor of the idea of what we can do with such uh, information. Um, we Really, there are two aspects to this research. What I've just described to you is that we're trying to get signatures of consciousness that are usable uh, in a fundamental manner to understand the architecture of the system. But we would also like to have signatures that uh, can be helpful in uh, applied domains and it's a very simple logic. We start with adult subjects who can report, tell us whether they've been conscious or not, and then we derive signatures of consciousness. And then we see if these signatures of consciousness are present in other organisms like the baby or the uh, vegetative state patients in which uh, they have no way to report. So let's start with the infants. Um, it's a little bit of a funny question, because if you look at this little guy, I think you would all agree that he's very likely to be conscious, right? Uh, he's, aware, he's, uh, he's all active and, and, and uh, moving his eyes and so on, but we don't really know. And in order to know, we need to apply a criterion. Um, so uh, we decided to use this masking test, and this is the work of Sid Quider at the Ecole Normale Supérieure and my wife, Gislaine de Anne Lambert, um, with replacing the digits with faces, because babies are extremely attracted to faces. So in this experiment, they would be flashed a face, and there was a pre-mask, and there was a post-mask, and a variable duration for the presentation of the face. And we tried to see whether there was a similar sort of series of stages with a nonlinear response characteristic in the baby. And uh, this is just summarizing a lot of work, but basically the answer is yes. Even in extremely young babies, this is the curve here is for 12 months old and 15 months old, but it is also the case in five months old. This is the earliest age in which the experiment was done yet. Um, you can see that you can distinguish between two very distinct stages of information processing in a baby. Flashing a short face will create a short activation, and in these initial stages, there is a completely linear uh, variation in activation due to the presence of the face, on top of the effect of the mask, uh, which is creating this... Uh, change here. So you see this linear increase here. But after a while, you find a completely different state of stages that are uh, essentially all or none. You see that all of the short durations of phase presentation are back at zero, and all of the longer durations of phase presentation are away from zero. And there is really a sort of bimodal distribution here. Um, it turns out that Sid Quido in a previous paper in cognition was able to uh, measure behaviorally what babies do with, uh, do with this sort of stimuli. And it turns out that the uh, cutoff here, which is between 50 and 100 milliseconds, is exactly the one where they begin to orient to the faces if they are presented in the periphery. So with short durations of presentation, they don't orient. With later durations, they orient. Okay. So uh, this seems to suggest that this discontinuity is similar, of course, to the architecture of the adult brain and uh, that it corresponds to the ability to have the information, although it's initially very short, to hold it online and use it for uh, behavioral, uh, flexible behaviors like orienting and more. Um, what's quite striking is that the architecture of the system seems to be the same in the baby. Um, what is very different is the latency. If you look at the latencies here, it's over one second. In uh, adults, it was, you remember, the P3, 300 milliseconds. So it takes the baby three times or perhaps four times longer to achieve the same sort of ignition pattern, all or non ignition pattern, that we are seeing in the adult. Um, we think that this is a very uh, common characteristic to many experiments in the baby, that uh, there, there is this extremely slow responding. It's not that uh, prefrontal cortex and uh, higher level areas do not respond at all. They do respond, but they respond extremely slowly, probably accumulating evidence over more, much longer time periods because of the slowness of the unmyelinated uh, association fibers in, in the cortex of the baby. So it's interesting to think of the baby as a conscious being. We don't know whether it's conscious from birth or not. I think it's likely, but very slow consciousness. Now, this is the last bit of the talk. I want to talk a little bit about the patients. 
here uh, we are collaborating with Lionel Nakash at Salpetria Hospital, and he has a very concrete problem. A patient has been in coma, recovers partially from coma, but may stay in so-called vegetative state, where the patient may have a sleep-wake cycle. He may wake in the morning and go to sleep in the evening, but in between has no responsiveness at all. Does not respond to order, uh, does not move his eyes in common, and so on and so forth. So how do you know whether the person is or is not conscious? The problem is difficult in particular because you, I think you know there was this work by Adrian Owen and collaborators in which they showed that one patient, initially just one, in apparent vegetative state was in fact able to generate very complex patterns of brain activity in response to complex orders. Um, so even though the patient was not moving, when she was asked to imagine playing tennis, um, she would generate activation in the SMA that seemed to match that of control. When she was asked to navigate her apartment, she would have another pattern of activity for 30 seconds that seemed to indicate mental imagery and uh, seemed to suggest that she was conscious of the instruction and able to follow it. So these sort of patients are challenging and suggest that we need better criterion. Now, fMRI is not the perfect tool for these patients. fMRI is in fact a little bit horrible because this patient was once in fMRI it was detected that she had these very complex patterns of activity, and then that's it. You cannot do an MRI every day, right? Uh, it's, in fact, quite technically quite challenging. So we believe that EEG will be a much better solution for these patients, and we try to play with our uh, stimuli in, and ideas in order to uh, create a test for these patients. So I will show you two different tests here. One that works modestly, one, one that works a little bit better. The one that works modestly, uh, this is the work that we did with Tristan Beckenstein in the lab. This idea was to measure the P3 in these patients. And if we could get a P3 in these patients and a clear response uh, at this global workspace level, then we would think the patient is conscious. Visually, it's difficult. It's very hard to do visual experiments in these patients because their gaze is not uh, very uh, fixed. Uh, they close their eyes and so on and so forth. So we decided to go to an auditory experiment and to use the novelty response, which also generates a very strong P3. So um, this is a very simple paradigm. Maybe I'll try to play the stimuli for you. Ah. Okay, this is Windows again. Don't believe what you're hearing. It's because you're not hearing the last sound. I'm not sure why. It should be beep, 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 boop. Okay? And the last sound creates, of course, a novelty response. Uh, and the novelty response, as you know, comprises an MMN and a P3. Mismatch response and then P3. Okay. So the problem, of course, is that the mismatch response has been reported to be unconscious. In uh, coma patients, for instance, it can be preserved. So we try to separate the two kinds of responses. So the, the way we did this is we repeated this sequence of five sounds several times with a gap. So beep, 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 boop. Beep, 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 boop. Beep, 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 boop. Beep, 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 beep. Okay. And you get the idea now that there is a novelty, which is a sort of second-order novelty. The novelty here is that the last sound is missing. It's not different. Instead of being different, it's not different on a fraction of trials. Okay. So we create an expectation, and then we violate it. It's very strange that the violation is a monotonic stimulus. So we are asking the brain to respond to a monotonic stimulus just because he has another expectation. Right? So the results from this is very uh, nice. There is a double dissociation between two systems. The mismatch response um, continues to react even in unconscious situations or in unattentive situations, even when you know you're going to get a different sound at the end. So the mismatch response, in a certain sense, is a pretty stupid system. I should not use that because it still is using predictive coding. It's using the past to predict the future. But um, it's doing so in a way which does not take into account the global context. So you still get a mismatch negativity here, even though you expect it. But the P3 is completely different. The P3 goes with the global novelty. And that you only observe when the patient is conscious. So if you distract a normal subject, you don't get it. You lose it completely. You only get it in the patient, in the subjects that are able to report that uh, there, there, there was novelty here. And in the patients, empirically, it sort of works. It works in an asymmetrical way. If you have a patient that has this global response, late, P3-like, um, and you see it relates also to a very distributed network, then you are pretty sure the patient is conscious. And we've used it in the clinic in a number of patients where it was non-trivial, that they were in fact conscious, but they were, uh, or they recovered the next day, for instance. 
But uh, there is still one problem with this measure. It's not very sensitive. It's nice when you find it. It's not very sensitive because, as I say, the subject could be distracted. And if he's distracted, you don't get the response. So the patient could be conscious but distracted. He could be conscious but unable to attend to these sort of sounds and so on and so forth. So there is still a big challenge here in trying to define methods that measure consciousness without attention or without requiring instructions from the patients and anything like that. So we're still working on that. I think I'll skip this. And um, we um, are going now to a slightly different form of analysis, which is trying to analyze the EEG itself, just the brain activity, the ongoing brain activity, and to try to detect in this ongoing activity traces of this long distance sharing of information that we claim is the basis for uh, conscious information. So there is no longer any stimulus here that's needed. All we want is to quantify the amount of circulation of information. So um, with uh, Jacobo Sitt and Jeremy King, we uh, invented a novel method, or at least there are some aspects that are novel, that uh, detect the communication of information between two sides of EG. I'll go very quickly because this is already long, but I think uh, you, know about symbol, you know about mutual information between two sides, X and Y. We're trying to compute mutual information in a symbolic manner by quantifying the order in which different samples of EEG arrive. And so you can attribute a different symbol to the six factorial three possible orders of the samples here. And then once you have uh, transformed the signal into symbols like this, you can really compute this symbolic mutual information matrix. And the one additional trick that I think is quite useful here is that we have a way to discard from this matrix any of the components that could come from common sources. So you wouldn't want to attribute a high connectivity value to two electrodes that are in fact picking the same cortical source, right? Uh, and uh, this is a problem for scalp EEG in particular. You may be sensitive at this electrode and this electrode to the same source in the middle. So what we do here is we discard all of the components of the matrix that either have the same symbols, like they are both going down here, or that have opposite symbols, like one is going up and the other is going down. So in this way, you can eliminate all of the, non, all of the trivial correlations between two signals and look only for non-trivial sharing of information. So we do this computation, and this is the result, very simple. The color here along the arc is proportional to the amount of sharing of information between two electrode sites. This is for technicality out of a uh, Laplacian transformation of the signal. And you can see immediately that the vegetative state patients, and this is a large number of patients, are separated from the others by uh, this measure of long distance communication. The minimally conscious patients, conscious patients, healthy patients have much higher values of information communication. It works very well as soon as the distance between the electrodes is 10 centimeters or more. So it doesn't work for the shorter distances. But interestingly, it really is the long distance sharing that makes a difference. And this is my last slide. We are working on this to try to uh, combine multiple measures that are derived from EEG into a sort of diagnostic helper for the patients. So what is done here is we have the clinical labels for conscious, minimally conscious, and vegetative. But we also have machine learning to try to use many different measures, the ones that I've shown you and a few more, um, to decide what is the label for the patient. And um, I don't think this is the magic you know, uh, gold label, uh, gold standard, because we know that there can be errors in the clinical diagnosis. So you can see that we get a nice diagonal, which means that we are relatively well able to categorize the patients into the appropriate categories. Um, Unfortunately, we're not quite at the level where we could say a single patient, we're sure he's conscious, so that's still work in progress. But there are interesting errors here that may not be errors. So I, I want to focus on this last category, the vegetative. Our computer systems sometimes say that these patients may be in the minimally conscious category. Minimally conscious means that occasionally they are conscious. They seem to have voluntary responding. And you see that Okay, this could be an error, maybe on the part of the computer, the machine learning algorithm, but what we find is that later on, if we wait six months, the patients that were classified in the minimally conscious category are the ones that recovered much better than the others. If there is agreement about the diagnosis of vegetative state, then the recovery is actually quite low. So 
we think that maybe the computer was already picking up on some kind of signal that was saying the patient was either already conscious or close enough to consciousness that he was able to recover. So we're excited by these results because they mean that we can begin to apply what we've understood about consciousness and that detection of long distance brain scale cortical cortical communication may be the right uh, tool for this. So I'll just close by showing you the face of the people who did a lot of this work. Lionel Nakash is a neurologist at Salpetriere Hospital, collected more than 200 patients. Jacobo Sitt analyzed it, uh, who, together with Jean-Rémy King. Lucy Charles did the error negativity work. Gislaine and Sid were involved in the baby work. And this is my last book, just out two weeks ago, and it summarizes a lot of this work. And thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, well, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you've noticed that there are, there are, I think there are two ways to respond to your uh, question. I think they, they answer it fully. The first one is that in many of the analyses I showed you, we were using the same exact stimulus, same duration, and uh, sorting the trials as a function of whether the subject responded seen or not seen, right? So the stimulus is constant, and that's what I like the best. Okay, so that's, that, that would be then what you find here. For instance, the... This one, the perceptual uh, Sorry, this is, this is the masking condition. Oh, sorry. This is the masking. So the delay for masking is 16, 33, etc. And basically what you see, it's especially clear for the N1. It's a very strong signal here. The N1 is essentially constant starting at 33 milliseconds. So I, I certainly believe that the 16 millisecond condition is not great. It could be exactly what you are saying. At 16 milliseconds, you get a reduction of the activation, perhaps due to retinal interactions. But as soon as you go to the 33 millisecond condition, you essentially have the same activation in the uh, visual occipitotemporal system measured by this N170, right? Yeah. So after that, you know, we're looking for, people call it correlates of consciousness. I don't like it too much because correlates, as you say, could start very <coughs> early on. It's it's probably likely that the source of the variability in the strength of the signal may start early on, uh, maybe due to fluctuations in retinal input. Some people have even found fluctuations before the stimulus, which is fine. You know, there is ongoing activity, and sometimes it aligns with the target, sometimes it does not. So it, uh, the source of the variability across trials may come from many different aspects. The point is that the only the late part has the right shape to be not just a correlate of consciousness, because this also correlates, you know, all of these, they correlate to some extent with the report, but, but to be a signature, that is to say something that has exactly the properties of the conscious report. That's what we are looking for. If the signal is small, you just need a simple threshold mm. not to go on to the, the next stage. Right. How so uh, do you know that the signal getting to the brain is the same, and I'm, I'm not convinced mm. it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. you're, you're, you're in a, an era of Mm. Okay. Uh, you don't have to believe me. Uh, there, there are some interesting, uh, uh, there are some interesting uh, experiments we, we reviewed also in the review that we published. One of them involves TMS directly into the brain, so this may be more convincing. So you can follow a TMS pulse. I didn't do this. This is somebody else's work. The same TMS pulse sometimes reported as seen, sometimes reported as not seen. The same sort of uh, results are shown here. Late divergences between seen and unseen trials. Yeah. Yeah, please. I'm not sure about the data, but there were some advertising once in the movies, like, like drinking Coca-Cola, and people say that they were buying more Coca-Cola or yeah. something. Do you know how long was it in this period? <laughs> now they probably be conscious or not conscious. If yeah. you are conscious, 
Right. So uh, we are playing with very similar things here. It's essentially similar durations. One frame of a movie, it's one twenty-fourth of a second. So it's similar sort of duration, 40 milliseconds. Now, the Coca-Cola experiment was never done. The Coca-Cola experiment is a fake. It was uh, later reported by the person that she never did, he never did the experiment. Okay, so uh, forget about it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but the yeah. No, no, it's true. People talk about it, but the, the guy who claimed to have done it later said it was fake. He never did the experiment. Um, the, now, the be behavioral effects of a subliminal prime are real, but they don't last very long. Uh, they, they may bias a decision, uh, we found that many times, for a duration of about one second. After one second, it's quite rare to find better than chance responding to a subliminal cue. There are some experiments now, so we should be careful because a lot of this game is that people say something is impossible without consciousness, and then people work a bit better, they find a better paradigm, they find, yes, it is possible better than chance without consciousness. So, but by and large, after one or two or three seconds, there is very little over <coughs> better than chance responding to a subliminal cue. And can you clarify, as comparison to the timing experiments you showed on Tuesday, mm. would you be able to say that uh, an unseen stimulus can change the, uh, the perceived or mm. the, the awareness of this stimulus when it comes again or doesn't come again? Okay, there yeah. There is a priming effect, yeah. and therefore there is a contribution of very small... Yes. So, absolutely, and I, I think the right way to think about this is in terms of this accumulation of evidence models, right? So, a subliminal stimulus is like a bolus of evidence, You're giving a little bit of evidence and you cut it with this mask, right? And sometimes the evidence is enough to make the vector climb and go above threshold, and sometimes it's not enough. It goes and then it, it gets shut down by the mask, right? So this, I think this is the way we're going to find that we should model this sort of situation. So in terms of priming, the evidence from the prime adds up with the evidence of the target. If they are compatible, the vector is already larger. If they are incompatible, then you went into the wrong direction. You get no, you get, uh, no priming or even inhibition. You get inhibition, but you're conscious of the inhibition. So uh, no. Not necessarily, no. All, all you say is, I saw the last stimulus, right? You're not aware that there was a little bit of that accumulation that started with the prime. I mean, this is a very new thing, although it makes use of a lot of old ideas from signal detection, so I'm not completely sure how to respond. But I do think that there are some features that build up continuously, and there may be some that are only feasible because you've already made this decision, you know, that there was or there was not a stimulus. So, um, but uh, anyhow, the idea of this model is also that consciousness is a decision. There is a threshold, and you have to... Uh, um, literally decide whether uh, the brain is making a decision whether the activation was or was not above a threshold. So it is, uh, we're trying to change the ideas here a little bit because people have claimed, you know, consciousness is not an interesting decision because it's all in the bias. You can be biased to respond I've seen or you can be biased to respond I've not seen and therefore we should not use these subjective decisions. I disagree completely with that because I think the bias is part of any such decision system. You are using your priors and you are using your past uh, trials to decide where you should put the cutoff, right? But it still is a valid report on the part of the subject. My question is, one subject decided that, uh, the, the, the brain decided that it is above the threshold. It is, possible, is it possible that several of the features won't be <coughs> active enough and, and some others will be active enough and then subject will have this weird experience of having awareness of several features and not others. Yes. And then, and if it's possible, 
again, it goes, it, it goes against the notion of all or none, because yeah. you have several features and not <coughs> others. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a great question, yeah. What you are describing is called partial awareness, partial awareness. And um, w when I say that the conscious access is all or none in some of these paradigms, uh, what I mean is that for a fixed content, you may or may not access it. Now, what you're describing is a change of content, right? You're essentially recategorizing the stimulus in a different way, and then you're saying, okay, I didn't see the digit, but I saw a little bar somewhere. That's, these are like two different decisions. Right? So the bar is for a feature. Hmm. Not, not for all of them Exactly. Yeah. But uh, this is an interesting issue. There are also this idea that maybe this unconscious space is there all the time, and then you can take multiple decisions on it, you know, one at a time. And so there is this whole movement of now talking about resampling the same uh, internal representation several times. And even if the first time you decided you didn't see, the second time you will still have some information in the third time. So uh, we... This is only a start of a modeling of this aspect. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how much the risk response depends on the awareness of that they are actually going to see a number? Ah. Or a mm. more generalized? Uh, well, okay, we haven't tested that uh, very carefully. So, only in our case, it, yeah, exactly. In our case, it's very narrow. In fact, it was only one, four, six, and nine. So, a very narrow set of digits. Because we wanted to have the same stimulus all the time. Um, now, people have done, uh, there is in particular this beautiful experiment by Lucia Meloni, uh, where she was looking at how well you see as a function of whether you know what you're going to see in advance. Or not. And what she finds is hysteresis. Uh, so when you know what is the target letter in her case, you can tolerate a shorter duration before you lose sight of the stimulus. And also, the brain activation is not the same. So this is a very interesting area of research. What she is finding is that when you know, then it's no longer the P3, which is the correlate of consciousness, it's a bit earlier. It seems to be more like in the N2 part of the response. So we still have to you know, put that all together. But it seems that expectation is playing a very big role here. When you expect the stimulus precisely, you have a lower threshold. I think it's more than you expect. You mm. predict the stimulus. Yep. Yes, yes. And the threshold is lower, yeah, exactly. Yes. And the response is shorter. No, because most of the cognition tasks are between not completely uh, unknown, mm. unexpected. Ah, absolutely. No. So there is clearly a big role of expectation. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like faces. Did you, do, did you do any face cognition? Only with the baby work, but no. Faces are hard to mask, actually, and this is, uh, that's why we're avoiding them, yeah. Symbols are much easier to mask. I don't think we understand that either very well. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Okay. That's a great question. I, we've tried to bring the driving situation to the lab. It's very difficult, but I think it is similar to the attentional blank situation. Uh, there, is, there are, of course, a series of experiments called inattentional blindness, which are trying to do very much what you are saying. So they're trying to put the subject in a frame of mind where he's completely focused on a certain task, and then uh, you get much longer, in fact, invisibility of stimuli than uh, the attentional blank. The difficulty is that for these experiments to work, you need to have a completely a subject who is not suspecting that you are going to test him with the <laughs> stimulus. Um, so they, no, it's true. It, the whole set of experiments have been done with a single trial per subject. <coughs> because as soon as you have a trial and you question the subject, did you see this, did you not see this, the next trial, they suspect that you are going to manipulate it. So um, these are extremely difficult experiments. And although, uh, exactly like you, I have the impression that the car driving situation would be a model for consciousness research because there is so much we do that seems to be non-conscious, it's been very hard to bring it in the lab at the moment. 
Thank you very much. Thank you.